You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Successful Screenwriter Podcast, where we discuss anything and everything screenwriting. Here we interview successful screenwriters and filmmakers to find out just what it takes to make it in the industry. All right, welcome to the podcast. We've got on a couple of awesome guests today. We have on Paul Zyman and Justin Sloan from the Creative Writing Life Podcast. Thanks for being on, guys. Thanks for having us, Jeff. Well, so we're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about like the life of being a writer, the struggles, the successes. Um, Before we really dive into that, though, I want to kind of get the origin story of you two coming together and how did this (laughs) podcast launch? Well, we got together uh, via a thing called Dundale Pro. There was a forum on there and I was reaching out, asking around about uh, how people got managers or specifically asking about this thing called Blacklist 2.0, right? Uh, BLCK list, whatever. And yeah. Paul had gotten a manager from there. So we got to chatting and then we were both in San Francisco. So we ended up meeting up for coffee and all that stuff. And we got to the point where I had been doing a podcast called Creative Writing Career. It was great. We started it with uh, Stefan Bugai and uh, my friend, my buddy, Kevin. And, but both of them just got too busy. Uh, Stefan went on to start a production company and Kevin was doing his other podcasts and stuff. And yeah. so we we're like, well, let's uh, let's transition out of this. And then I, I was thinking, well, who do I know who's smart and fun to talk to? Paul. <laughs> so <laughs> we started chatting That's about awesome. the idea of doing one. And then, and then it kind of, you know, things take time. So six months later or so, finally, we got to it. Right. And, uh, and and Paul runs the Maximum Z blog, which is a top 50 screenwriting blog, which is awesome. Congratulations. Thank you and, very much. And uh, Justin, you're a screenwriter, novelist. You've worked on uh, Telltale Games. So you did uh, Tales of the Borderlands and, I mean, some fantastic stuff you guys have done. So coming together, this sounds like a pretty amazing podcast. It's been a lot of fun. I mean, um, ju- yeah, like Justin said, he came to me because uh, I – you know, we met, you know, we talked to, we really connected via screenwriting and kind of, we just our friendship developed from there. And then he eventually, uh, like, yeah, we, I'm in San Francisco. He's now down in Los Angeles uh, and he had this, you know, podcast, the creative writing career. And I was on that once as a guest and that was a lot of fun. And as he said, you know, eventually he wasn't able to do it anymore, but then he, but he still wanted to do a podcast. So he came to me and said, Hey, would you be interested in doing this? And I just really like the idea of it because it's, we, the, the, the title kind of says it all, the creative writing life. Yeah. And we're, ta- we're talking to writers of all kinds, you know, all genres, all mediums. We've talked to authors, we've talked to screenwriters, we've talked to other game writers and really talked about like how they got into it, how, what's their process right. you know, like, and how did they put all of this together to get where they are now? And for me, I mean, I really don't know anything about novel writing. That's really Justin's uh, specialty. Yeah. But just to me, just to listen to these people talk about it, it's just fascinating. Like uh, I can't remember the, the guy's name, but he's down, I want to say in Florida, and he wrote like these kind of were they like spy novels or kind of like, you know, espionage thriller novels, but they were all set in Florida. And so it had like that, you know, that Florida tint yeah. to it. And That's it was awesome. just a really it was just great stuff. And we talked to another guy who's like created his own superhero uh, line of books. And it's just been a lot of uh, fun, a lot of fast, fascinating people. Well, the the struggle is real as a writer. You know, I mean, you have to get out there and you have to make your successes happen, right? No one's going to do it for yourself. So I know you're out there, you're working the hustle, Justin is as well. So the struggle is real real for writers. I mean, trying to, to, like, if you're a novelist, self-published, I'm a self-published author. I know how difficult it is. I know what we're going up against. Sometimes it feels like you're going up against the system until you can finally start to make those ends. What kind of themes have you found with these other writers or even in your own journeys about that struggle? Well, just to really address the novel part, but uh, you know, for me, it's all about, you know, trying to break in as a screenwriter and you know, I've done like almost every approach that you can probably think of. I've done right. contests. I've sent a whole bunch of query letters. I've gotten read requests, you know, and, you know, a lot of times, a lot of them don't go anywhere, but, you know, it's better than not even trying. Right. And so 
part of what I'm doing this year is I've like taken taking the whole year off of contests. I'm not entering any. I just really want to focus on becoming a better writer so that I can hone my craft, but also that will help me in the long run that, you know, eventually I can, the scripts that I'm working on now that I can show these and it'll hopefully be a better example of my writing. And, you know, for me, you know, the dream is someone reads my script and says, oh, I love this. Let's see what we can do about getting this made. But in some ways I'm also a realist. And I also yeah. know that, you know, People, uh, I also totally find if someone reads my script and says, I love this, love the way you write, there's no way I could get this made, but I really like the way you write. You know, would you be interested in working on this other project? And my approach is like, yeah, sure. Because I'm not one of those writers who's like, well, if it's not going to be my material, you know, not, and no, not a single word changed, then I don't want to deal with it. Exactly. So it's more like, you know, hey, if you like this and you want to work with me, you know, let's take it from there. Yeah. And hopefully that's what, you know, this coming year and all the, and all of the, time and effort I put into honing my craft over the years that will all pay off. So, you know, for now, I realize that, you know, it's, it's a long struggle and as one of the sayings is, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So you have to go into this knowing it's going to take a long time. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think, Justin? Yeah, I'd say one of the biggest struggles and themes or issues that people deal with as authors is, uh, especially once they go full time is anxiety, <laughs> how you struggle, how you juggle the idea of, uh, you know, your work life balance and all that and how you juggle your creativity versus that voice in your head that says, Oh my God, I'm a failure. What have I done? Why am I doing this? <laughs> <And> <laughs> they're going to, they're going to figure out that I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> I think I figure that out. And you just talk to so many authors who are all dealing with that. And so in a way it's comforting to know that you're not the only person uh, going, ah, yeah, <laughs> all the time, but uh, it's definitely definitely an issue more when you go full time because then you've suddenly realized, wait, if this next book doesn't deliver, and then after that doesn't deliver, what am I going to do? You right. Know I, mean? um, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that yet. It's something I feel like I have the answer to every once in a while, and then it just kind of falls away again. <laughs> but I've been doing this for four and a half years now, full time. Hopefully, it'll keep going for the rest of my life, and then. I'll be able to look back and say, oh, I had the answer a whole lot. Right? Oh, man, there's so much to unpack here, guys. So I think let's break it down. So the struggle is real. Cognitive dissonance is real. So you can be out there winning awards, making the placements, getting the managers, getting the gigs and still feel unworthy. I mean, this is something I can say I've honestly struggled with. I have felt like uh, like. They're going to believe I'm a fraud. One day they're going to see my stuff and say, like, this guy's tricked everybody, you know? And and it's just, I think, because this craft can be almost so esoteric in its approach of so many different avenues of what success is considered as, you know, I mean, I even put in my book, there are different levels of success or success is whatever you make out of it, if it is getting that manager, if it is winning that that contest or, or writing that movie or writing that game or whatever success is to you, that is success. And I think that's probably the easiest way to do that. But um, comparing yourselves to other people's successes, I find is kind of like the way to get yourself in trouble because their journey is their journey. It's not necessarily your journey. That's something that I've had to learn um, definitely as a self-published author where I had to, I tried to get the book published traditionally and they said, they told me there was no market for it. And I said, well, I am the market. So obviously there is. So I put it out there and, and the book has done really well. So I think you, you have to try and find ways to believe in yourself, even when you're secretly don't. Do you guys have ever encountered where you kind of had to fake it till you make it moments? I, I wouldn't put it that way, but I think expanding on what you said is that you have to keep in mind, like every writer, if they don't reach the goal that they set for themselves, then they're going to beat themselves up thinking, oh my God, I'm such a failure. Why don't yeah. I even try? But you also have to keep reminding yourself that everybody has a different path. Everybody's path is unique unto yeah. themselves. I mean, I've got writer friends who I know, I know this one writer, she's been a nickel finalist, a top 10 finalist twice. Wow. And she's still both scripts, you know, she can't do anything with them. Nobody, and like, that's really good. Yeah. It's a very well-written script, but you know, there's no market for it or I just yeah. can't get a producer interested in it. And I also know, you know, people who've had 
you know, they decided not even to go the contest or career route. They just started making their own shorts and that expanded to, you know, getting their own films made. You know, yeah. granted, they're not, they're, you know, like, you know, probably, you know, micro budget or under a million dollars total, yeah. but they were able to achieve their, the success that they wanted. And so it's real easy to think, oh, I'm, I'm just not good at this because, you know, you tried maybe what you thought worked for other people. And you thought, well, if it worked for that guy or that lady, yeah. I can try it. And it doesn't work for you. Think, well, that's just the wrong way to go. But a lot of writers don't really realize that you kind of have to make your own path it's and true. just figure, figure out what works best for you. And, you know, and that takes time. I mean, it's, it's all part of the whole process, which, you know, again, takes a long time to overall. Yeah. I think on the fake it till you make it idea, especially in regards to self-publishing, it's an interesting one because you can put your books out there whenever you want and they don't have to be necessarily at the quality that an editor at a big five or three or whatever it is publishing yeah. company would say is amazing. Right. And they don't have to have that big marketability in the same way because you could find your niche market that they'd never know how to target. Right. And you explode by your standards, uh, you know, making like 50 or $60,000 on a book is awesome for them. They might be like, and it's mediocre, but for right. one person that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then there's that point. It's like, is it faking it? Or does it matter? Because you find out that some readers just don't give a crap about all that fancy prose. And sometimes they even find it annoying because it's like, right. hey, I don't think this way. I don't talk this way. Why is this book talking to all this flowery purple crap? I yeah. just want to have a fun story that takes me along this journey. So, for example, my first book that I ever wrote is online. It's it's on Amazon. It's published under the same name as all most of my other stuff. And I don't think I'm going to unpublish it because there are certain readers who love it. And I found many emails from people like in hospital beds were like, Hey, you're writing wow. brings me to my life. And it's amazing. And you're like, that's amazing. Yeah, it's great. But you can look at that book and say, wow, that's pretty crappy. You know, it's, it's horribly yeah. done yeah. by my standards now, however many years later, I guess this is about 10 years later from when I wrote that one. Uh, you know, so in many ways it'd be embarrassing, but at the same time, uh, it's not really faking it in that sense because it has touched those people's lives. And, in that way, done some amazing, uh, which is one reason I set out to write was to touch people's lives. So it's already Absolutely. done what I wanted it to. And that's you finding your version of success, which is amazing on top of getting paid to be a, a pro writer. Um, for me, it was, you know, writing can be so you can be in such a state of isolation with writing, you know, not just because we're in our own little writing caves and everything like that, but especially with COVID and everything, you're in your, your own, you're in your own little bubble, even when you network and stuff, it's, it's still very, can be very singular. And when I released the book and the book was doing okay, and um, then it started to chart, I, I didn't, I still didn't think anybody was reading it. You know what I mean? Because I'm not getting any feedback. I'm not talking to people. I would go to book signings. I'd sign the book and people shake your hand and everything. And, and you just, you play the part. Um, but then when I started getting like phone calls from mothers whose kids were wanted to be screenwriters or, uh, or phone calls from people that were, at the bottom of, of their like rock bottom. And then they read the book and it changed their lives around that hits you and you go, Oh my God, okay, this, this thing is happening and I'm honored to be part of it. And I think once you start kind of getting feedback like that, or, or, or finding that your work is really an affecting people, Paul, even as a screenwriter, if somebody reads your script and they have an emotional uh, response to that script, you've affected that person's life. I mean, that's a that's a strong feeling. Yeah, oh, well, definitely. Because I mean, I've had people read my scripts, and you know, you always hope for a positive reaction. That you know, I'm sure every writer has that daydream that you know someone reads your script and they'll get back to you and say, "Oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever read." <laughs> and, and of course, that never happens, and that's okay. But yeah. you know, it's a nice little dream. But you know, I've had people read my scripts and you know the compliments you know, they're not gushing they're just you know i really like this this was such a visual thing i could you know i would love to see this on the big screen and you know just really positive feedback is it, it's it's uplifting for right. any writer that you know you would love to you know have <laughs> you know flowers you know, you know strewn yeah. about you as you as you walk down the hall but you know, just someone saying, hey, this was really good. I liked reading it. Thank you. You know, that, that's even more effective. It, it, it makes much more of an impact. And, you know, going back to just trying to make an impact on people, that part of my process for this year is I wanted to kind of, I, I don't want to say 
give it back. But yeah, part of my theory of you know, becoming a better writer is just to read more scripts. And I can read professional scripts, but I also wanted to kind of like return the favor. So I put out the offer, hey, you know, I want to get be a better writer. And that means giving notes. So if, awesome. you want, if you want notes on your script, let me know. <laughs> the floodgates just opened. Yeah, you got bombarded. And there's no, there's no I, way you didn't. I certainly did, but I'm slowly, <laughs> I'm slowly chipping away at it. I only have like five or six left out of the initial wow. like 42. Oh my uh, goodness. Yeah, trust me, it's a lot. Um, but and so I'll, you know, I'll send the notes back, and I'll just try to be as constructively helpful with the script and the, you know the story and the formatting, the you know the whole package. And just about every writer has responded saying thank you so much. This was so helpful. Like you, you've picked out things like I've had like 10 other people read this and then none, none of them picked on this, picked up on this one thing. And, you know, like you, I can't believe you found that typo on page 60. Cause I'm, I'm yeah, I've, I've got an eye for that. Oh, and, okay. and so just to have people really appreciate uh, my effort to help them. It's, it's really nice because it goes back to that whole, you know, that imposter syndrome. Like, do I know what I'm doing? Do I have any right. talent for this? That I guess seeing that my input can help someone make their script better, that, you know, that really helps me feel better as a writer overall and gives me a little more faith in my own abilities. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got to find it. Well, guys, I, go ahead. No, please, Justin. Well, I was going to say, I think also you have, like what you said about finding your idea of success is important because... Uh, otherwise you might never make it if your idea of success is that everybody around you loves your writing uh sorry because <laughs> <laughs> you know like, for have- a long wait i need yeah, a i need a string that. quartet following me around whenever someone reads my my script yeah. so that way i know i've been successful it's a lot of taste it's so subjective we had people who were acclaimed screenwriters who were hired to work on stuff at telltale where they would then leave and then people would go around talking crap about how horrible writers they were. They, we'd have people who like, I'd go write a scene <clears throat> and then people would be like, Oh, this is great. This is so great. And then somebody else who was in charge of a different office would take it and be like, Oh, this is crap. And then somebody's thrown out the window. So that person <laughs> like it. Oh my you know, goodness. Like, okay. and, then, and then they write something and then you read it. You're like, Oh my God, this is garbage. But the people who follow that person around love it. And oh, so you, yeah. you know, finding those, those fan groups. clubs. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, just to, you know, to even further that idea that it's all subjective, like both Justin and I have read for the Austin uh, Film Festival screenwriting contest. Cool. And to be, to qualify for that, you have to take this test. So they send you a couple of scripts and say, read these, give notes. Gotcha. And so I read these, the two that I sent, one I thought was great. And that one apparently didn't really, I think he made it like to the first round, maybe, I don't remember. But the second one, I thought it was awful. I just thought it was a terrible script. Turns out it won for best comedy. Oh no! <laughs> I'm thinking how I, this was not funny. It didn't I, hit well, you. No, it did. I didn't think it was funny at all. I found the the main character was just annoying, and I where was where was the humor in this story? Because I sure as hell didn't see it. Yeah, let's talk about subjectivity then, because I I run Script Summit, so so we have uh, a bunch of different readers, and we do like a lot of like I would say QA testing to make sure everybody is mm. kind of on the same keel so we'll have ju- we'll have readers check each other without them knowing it's kind of it's it's a whole system you know but i'm all about trying to keep everything fair because i've seen festivals where it's very much uh if you're friends with people you win or if you've submitted several years in a row you walk away with an award eventually um mm-hmm. and that's and i'm not i'm not interested in running a show like that um or a contest and and we've had people in in the summit who have won one year and don't even make officials the next year um, just because you're writing. Sometimes you've got a great script and sometimes you don't. And subjectivity when, er, and objectivity when it comes to readers trying to get your stuff pitched like query wise. I mean, that's a tough thing to get past because uh, we don't really necessarily write for producers as much as we're writing for the reader to get past the reader, to get to the producer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's so, it's so difficult. You don't really have that kind of a wall to get through and other, and other crafts or, or disciplines. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. I, well, that's one thing I always wonder about, especially, you know, contests is that, you know, what are the, how do they gauge the qualifications of the readers? Yeah, because the reader may know the basics of what is a screen race, a screenplay is supposed to look like. Right. Yeah. You know, would they know like a really good one from a really lousy? Is one? it an intern? 
Yeah. Let's I mean, be honest. Or, or, That's or, what or, you're or asking. Is it like, or is it someone like at a college screenwriting class? Right. Who's like still learning, you know, okay, what's a slug line again? You know, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. How, what are they stuck on? What is, what is their sense of taste? Uh, we end up having uh, readers that, that again, I, I make sure that they're qualified, but then they specialize. So we only have readers that read comedy. We only have readers that read horror, you know, that type of a genre, because I think that's how you're going to succeed and at least eliminating as much of that, of that subjectivity, because if you have somebody that, that only reads comedy and doesn't under sci-fi, you don't want them judging a sci-fi. Yeah. They say that, well, the same thing applies to the same, I guess you could call it the same criteria applies to like when you're sending your script out. Yeah. I mean, like people will just do a, a blanket uh, email of queries and they'll just send like, oh, I've got this, you know, this, you know, really you know, low budget horror that I want to send out. You're not going to send it to like the company that makes independent, you know, films about <laughs> kids in the city. The foreign drama, the foreign exactly. drama films. Yeah, exactly. No, you know, the shotgun approach doesn't work at all. Um, targeting queries is, is your best chance, but even any kind of a querying situation is it's so difficult to find success in, especially right now with the post COVID life. So let's talk about, unique avenues of success. Cause I know this is something that you guys definitely focus on with a creative writing life podcast. And I read an article once that, that drove me nuts and I was so frustrated. So in this article, um, this guy talks about the only way to find success as a screenwriter. And it was to go down to LA. You have to be in LA. Um, and then he, he said, you know, you have to get a job, on a studio lot somewhere. And then you just have to eventually sleaze your way into whatever manager or producer you can find. And he said, that was the only way to do it. And I was just like, well, I'm living in Detroit and I'm getting paid to write screenplays and I, I don't have to sleaze my way anywhere. So, and, and how many movies has this guy had produced? Yeah. I, I think he had one optioned. So, I mean, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you, of course, that it doesn't have to be that one thing. Uh, like my own example, I was working at the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, realizing I hated doing data analysis and liquid liquidity and all this bullcrap, and uh, <laughs> I just climbed my way out. So I just started doing the online networking thing where I reached out to people on uh, LinkedIn, worked at Pixar and other places like that, and then ended up working out where some of them had gone over to Telltale. And then when I sent my writing samples in, they were familiar with me enough so that they would like working with me. And, and so things kind of worked out in that sense. So you fo- you formed relationships on right. LinkedIn and then kind of followed people. That's yeah. brilliant, so man. You don't have to only do it in person anymore, especially during COVID. People are mm-hmm. much more receptive to it now, which is great. Uh, even back then, they were fairly receptive to it. Uh, some people less so. But, you know, now it's great because if you'd be like, hey, can we uh, hop on Zoom and chat for a little bit? It's kind of like that's expected right now. It's yeah, like doing absolutely. Like, we're doing it right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, and, and also... Uh, um, Justin and I, we had him on the podcast uh, last year as a screenwriter named Bob Sines. And he, you know, not, not to take away from Jeff's success, but he also wrote a book called That's Not the Way It Works. And yeah. Bob, Bob is a very successful screenwriter. And he lived here in the Bay Area up until recently, just relocated to Tennessee. But, you know, he was able to really establish a career for himself, not being in Los Angeles. You know, awesome. Sure, he had to go down there for meetings and such. Right. But he was able to do everything and, you know, with a, a not in Los Angeles base. And so now, you know, he's even further away from LA now, but he's still writing constantly. And he's, you know, he's a very busy and active uh, and has a lot of stuff uh, produced as a screenwriter. So, so the theory that you have to be in LA for television, yes, but for films, no, because you can write anywhere. And like Justin said, you know, especially with, everybody on zoom now it's so much easier to connect with you know producers and you know hopefully representatives that you can really establish your career from anywhere yeah yeah so don't let don't let someone say oh you you, you want to be in movies you want to you, you got to move to uh, to la yeah not ne- not necessarily i mean it will it will work to your benefit to be there but it's not necessarily a necessity if you're yeah. active about it a lot of people are pretty lazy about this stuff uh, you know, you have to reach out of your comfort zone sometimes. Uh, but like, of course, there are the stories that we've talked to people like on CWC, the old podcast, we talked to Edward Reichort, who met his producer through playing basketball, and they've been playing basketball together for a while. 
before finally he said, oh, I'm a producer. And he said, oh, I'm a screenwriter. And then <laughs> <it> just boom. <laughs> and that's and then that movie about the magicians breaking into banks uh, was yeah. made. Yeah. So you, now you see me. And I know a writer, he's actually in Western Pennsylvania. And he started uh, just as like uh, giving notes on scripts. And this guy came to him and said, hey, could you help me you know, write a couple of shorts? And so they did. And they established a working relationship. And that eventually developed into him working on a feature for him. And I think he's had like two or three of these, you know, they're very low budget, but he's got his name on these uh, films awesome. and, and he's, and he's still in Western Pennsylvania. So he's, he's been able to make it work for himself. Yeah. That's yeah. perfect. I mean, it, it's just, story that you can tell about being in LA and how it helps, of course. But, uh, yeah, sure. The obvious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, pre COVID life, it was like, I mean, I know guys that were going down to LA and they were like, they were doing it, you know, and, and living in their car and doing that whole situation. Um, I got a family. I'm not interested in that. So I was like, how do I make this work from Detroit? And then just working, you know, networking and, and figuring out the hustle, you know, of, of what you have to do to to survive and 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 find your version of success. Um, now, Paul, earlier you mentioned about, oh, no, I'm sorry, Justin. Justin, you mentioned about how your earlier work isn't as good as you work now. And I mean, I have to agree, right? If I look at my scripts that I wrote 10, 15 years ago, I go, why did somebody want to option this? You know, and then I look at the stuff I have now and I was like, okay, it's a different level. So we get, we get better with time. We get better with practice, um, hands down. Is there anything that you guys are doing on top of just grinding out, you know, hitting those keys every night and practicing outside of, of, of that? Yeah, well, I'm a constant learner. I'm a constant doubter of myself. So I'm always thinking, how can I get better? <laughs> and so Same. one of the big ways I do that is YouTube or Facebook has Facebook Watch. They have a thing that I've been following lately. I forget what it's called right now, um, but we could probably find the link where basically they just show clips from movies and then it plays the screenplay along. Yeah, with them. that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Uh, I think that's great. But I'm watching YouTube. I've been studying directing a lot more lately, too, and editing. Oh, brilliant for the purpose of learning those if I ever have a chance to do that, but also because I feel like that'll make you a better writer thinking about how the editor thinks and, uh, you know, watching drumline and then watching somebody talk about how the editing drumline is awesome. Not drumline, sorry, whiplash, how the editing whiplash is so amazing. It's, yeah. it's a really great experience. It makes you think about story in a different way. Uh, but also I'm always big on the books about craft. I listen to a lot of them on audible or okay. library apps like uh, what's that one overdrive or whatever it is. They have a lot of audiobooks on there about screenwriting or writing or, and just about Hollywood too, which is fun or biographies about the different famous people like Walt Disney stuff. Those are all inspiring. They might not teach you anything, but I also think that sometimes story ideas just come through that. Awesome. Uh, and then I've also have a master's in creative writing from Johns Hopkins that I did when I was trying to improve my craft. And I feel like that helped a lot. People yeah. always ask the question of, you know, the degrees and whatnot. Uh, and and I did a one year screenwriting program at UCLA, which was their certificate thing. And I did the sitcom one because I didn't know anything about sitcoms. So I was like, I'll just do what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that helped a lot. Uh, all these things can definitely make you a better writer. And so, yet somehow they still never make you a great writer. I wanted to comment on your <laughs> your thing about you know previous things, drafts though, or old screenplays and whatnot. I've been I've been thinking about that lately. It's an interesting question because I feel like yeah. maybe. In my quest to become better, I've also lost something along the way. Like I look at one of my early screenplays, I just like would place in all these screenplay contests and do quite well. Uh, so I wonder if sometimes there's that childlike excitement that plays through on our early drafts that you might lose down the road somewhere. So we got to figure out a way to get back in touch with that, that exciting passion side. I think that's funny because I look back at my first work that, that it was optioned and I was like, this was garbage. Like, <laughs> like, like it's like people wanted, people wanted to pay for this. Um, and then I look at the stuff I do now and it, it's, it's, yeah, there, there was, um, I think the child wonderment, I think what it is, Justin, is that you just don't know any better. You don't know the rules. So you just sit down and write something from your heart. I mean, everybody has a great story in them, right? So that first screenplay you write, you're writing it out of a blissful ignorance. So there is a, is a spark there. It, there is a little bit of magic there um, that, can, that can make a, a bad script look good. 
And and I think we can recapture it though. I find when I come on a gig, I can bring that that special sauce to the gig if I can find something that I, I emotionally connect with on the gig, if whether it's through character or theme, if I can if I can attune myself to either of those, I can bring something pretty good to the script. If I struggle with that, I'm not the right writer for the job. Yeah, I agree completely. We we bust out a lot of novels. I try to write about one a month and what? you definitely get across yeah see what you hit one a month you know, like crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's all about that. If you can find the moment or the yeah. heart of the story, the thing that excites you, then you'll be able to do it and turn it around in that month. Right. If not, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah if you're if you're just grinding it out, man, that's got it that's got it's got to be tough to keep yourself behind the keys at that point. So so Paul uh, what about you? I mean, it sounds like Justin is an eternal student. Sounds uh, sounds <laughs> like you've got that that similar kind of vibe. Uh, in a way, I think as you know what we we're just talking about that you can tell when you read a script that the writer loves their story. That there's a there's almost like a sense of like they had fun writing it. And that's kind of what I tr- try to go for with my stuff too. Awesome. That when you read a script that, you know, there's just this, there's a flow to it. There's an energy that, you know, you just want to keep turning the page. Yeah. And that's not, it's not just the sign of good writing. It's good storytelling. And that is really key because, I mean, I've read scripts that it's a great idea, but it was just poorly executed on the page. Right. Or that, you know, the writing's really good, but, you know, I'm just not that, interested in seeing what happens uh, that it, it's finding that really yeah. delicate connection between the two that if you can find it uh, as a reader that's great and if you can develop that as the writer like that's even better because you want people to be excited to read your script that you know no matter what the genre like if you have a horror and you know people actually say you know, I, I couldn't read this at, at night i had to read this in the daytime or i had to read this with the you know with the, all the lights that's on awesome. in the living room yeah or you know or you have a comedy and people say i just you know i, I you know there was a laugh on every page you know that's yeah. you know th- that you can tell that the reader got what you were going for and to really kind of find that on the page that it's just a skill that again it takes time to develop but once it's there it's just so great to have them i don't know appreciate it to have them recognize it yeah yeah and to breathe breathe that life into your work and and find out that um eventually it it becomes like a, a almost like a second nature as you're writing but then you have to still go back and and go over it and use all of the tricks that we use in order to really create a story. Uh, all right, so this has been pretty awesome, guys. If this is what your podcast is like, I, I can't wait to listen to more episodes. It is a Creative Writing Life podcast with Paul Zeidman and Justin Sloan. Yeah, and to elaborate, it's basically covering for novelists, screenwriters, game writers, we feel like there's a lot of crossover there and we've seen that uh, the people who have stories to share often come from the same place. You know, it's all these same issues that we're dealing with and how you're learning, how you're grappling with anxiety, uh, who you are as a writer. And that's one thing we wanted to approach on this one versus other podcasts that we've done or listened to. It's not about yeah. learning the craft on our podcast or learning all the marketing tricks. It's about who are these writers and how did they accomplish this awesome life? Yeah, it sounds like you guys are exploring and celebrating writers and their journeys, which I think is amazing. There's so much power in, in someone's origin, which is why on this show, we love to start out with that because it really humanizes who people are. And again, like I said earlier, we all kind of feel isolated at one point. And so to be able to listen to your show and to realize there is somebody else out there going through this can actually help you really along your path. So I think it's great. You guys are doing beautiful work. All right. So we just promoted the podcast. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to go a little crazy. We're promoting all the things now. So, all right. Paul's got the maximum Z blog, which is awesome. Uh, what else you got going on, Paul? Well, as you just said, uh, so yeah, please check out my screenwriting blog. It's maximumz.blog. And I'm on Twitter at maximum underscore Z. And um, I'm pretty big on following people who follow me. Awesome. And Justin, where can we find your wares, sir? 
Yeah, so of course there's the games and all that, but uh, for the book side, I'll say we have a book called Creative Writing Life that I wrote with my old co-host, uh, Stefan Bugai, and he has a lot to offer. He worked at Pixar for a while and is now out doing producing and was the uh, creative director at Telltale when I was there. Awesome. So yeah, some fun stuff. And we just include a lot of interviews in there too, so it's more uh, of this fun goodness. So I'd say that on Amazon, if you just search Justin Sloan, I think I actually changed that to Justin M. Sloan so that, you know, it's a little bit different from my fiction stuff. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Just give us the links and we'll make sure they're they're in the details of this episode. All right, very good. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share in your social media where you can tag us at the successful screenwriter.